Okay, so let's get right to it. What the hell happened to Pluto? Why is it no longer a planet, even that's what we were all taught to believe growing up? So it turns out there's actually a bunch of reasons, and many of them are actually pretty darn reasonable. So let's, let's start off with what do we know about Pluto in the first place? Basically, Pluto is weird. There's a whole bunch of things about Pluto that don't fit any of the other planets that we have in our solar system. The other eight planets being um, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Um, so, first of all, Pluto's orbit varies between 30 and about 50 AUs away from the Sun. Now that's way more, way more variation than any other planet we have. This would be the same thing as if Earth went from inside of Venus's orbit all the way out to almost Mars's orbit once every year. Second, uh, the orbit's inclined at an angle of 17 degrees above the ecliptic. It goes way above the plane of the solar system and then way below the plane of the solar system. Way above and way below. No other planets do that. This is the only one that's tilted like this. It's weird. Third, it spins on its side. Instead of spinning more or less upright or, or at a slight angle like Earth and Mars are, um, Pluto spins on its side. Now, honestly, this, is, this has precedent. Uranus does this as well, but the fact is, it's weird. Now, if we look at the mass of the planet, Pluto's mass is only 0.2% of the mass of the Earth, two one thousandth the mass of the Earth. And it's also less than 2% of the moon's mass even. So you could fit more than 50 moons into something the same mass as, I mean, sorry, you could fit more than 50 Plutos into something the same mass as our moon. Not only that, but Pluto is actually smaller than seven other moons in the solar system. So not just our moon, but the moons of Jupiter, some of the moons of Saturn. It's, it's tiny. You could actually fit, um, or I mean, you, you could not even fit if you tried to put the continent of Asia on the planet of Pluto. Asia would not even fit on, on all of Pluto's surface, nor would Africa, nor would North America, nor would even South America. So, uh, the surface area of Pluto is smaller than those four continents, not combined, but simply just any of those four continents. So it's, it's very small, much, much smaller than anything else that we currently call a planet. Um, Pluto has a moon. Its moon is Charon. Charon is actually half the size of Pluto itself. Now this would be the same thing as if Mars, which is about half the size of Earth, It'd be the same thing as Mars was orbiting the Earth, where our moon is today. We'd look up and we'd see a huge object up in the sky. Again, also completely unprecedented in our solar system. It's weird. Now, another thing, Pluto is composed of mainly, if you look in the interior, mostly water ice or other types of ices. And then the surface, we think, is actually mostly frozen nitrogen. Well, we can't call it nitrogen gas, but frozen nitrogen. Now, um, as Neil deGrasse Tyson is fond of saying, if you actually brought Pluto, anywhere close to the sun, in the, in the realm of the terrestrial planets, it would melt. So is that really a planet if it's just going to melt? And finally, and this is the most recent discovery, and this is kind of what has prompted the whole idea of is Pluto a planet or not, uh, we've realized that Pluto shares its orbit with many, many other objects out there, which together make up the Kuiper Belt. So uh, let's look more at that here. The story of how Pluto actually got demoted, how it, it has gone from being what we call a planet to now what we call a dwarf planet. So first of all, Pluto was discovered in the 1930s. Um, the person who discovered it was Clyde Tombaugh, but he was actually working basically on the back of Percival Lowell, who had spent the last 20 some years of his life trying to find this mysterious planet that he called Planet X. Uh, he was never able to do it, but he funded a he, he put a huge amount of money and uh, uh, resources into developing the technology and the observatories and the places to actually discover it. And so Clyde Tombaugh, who was working at Lowell's um, observatory, eventually was the one who ended up finding this in the 1930s. And right away, it was called a planet. They had a big committee, um, a, a big uh, question, what should we name it? And um, it turned out it was kind of a cool story. An eight-year-old girl wrote in and said, um, uh, why don't we call it Pluto, the lord of the underworld? And this is kind of where Pluto's realm is. It's the very, very cold, most outer reaches of the solar system. So she, uh, she suggested naming it after the lord of the underworld in, in Greek mythology. And they like this because the first two letters of Pluto, P-L, happens to be the initials of Percival Lowell, whose uh, observatory it was found at, basically. So um, Pluto was named. Then we have a cool little dog named Pluto that uh, Disney created, named after the planet, not, not vice versa, of course. And it, it stuck. So from 1930 on, it was the ninth planet, and everyone's cool with that. But here's the problem. So in about the 1990s, we started seeing a whole bunch of other stuff way out there in the same region where Pluto is orbiting. 
and other stuff that we actually realized kind of had similar properties to Pluto, mainly made of ice with weird orbital patterns above the planet's solar system goes in and out. Um, other properties that are way more similar to Pluto than any of these other planets that we actually call planets now. Uh, by the way, um, a bit of news, the Kuiper Belt was actually only discovered in 1992. Uh, its existence had been predicted before then, but we didn't actually be begin discovering any other object in the Kuiper Belt, uh, other than Pluto, of course, until the 90s. So everything else that we see out there that many of which we actually now call dwarf planets, were not around, or it's not that they weren't around, but they just, we did not know about them until the 90s. So this was kind of a technological advance that helped us see the truth, what, what other stuff was out there. And so we kept finding more and more things, um, more and more Kuiper Belt objects, more large objects out there, um, smaller than Pluto, a little bigger, a little bigger. Eventually in 2005, we discovered what we now call Eris, uh, which is actually a Kuiper Belt object, or, or a, what we call a trans-Neptunian object, out there in the realm of Pluto, which is even bigger than Pluto itself. And so this was really kind of the turning point in the, in the whole uh, story here. Until then, we were okay with calling Pluto a planet, even though there was a whole bunch of other stuff out there that were kind of similar to it. But then once, once we realized that, hey, Pluto is actually not even the biggest one of these things out there, uh, we, should, we realized that maybe we should reconsider what is a planet. And the question became, Okay, there's Eris. It's bigger than Pluto. Should we call that a planet? And then we realize there's a whole other, you know, dozen or so of these things that, that are candidates for actually being Pluto-like objects out there. If we discover each one, what do we determine as a planet or not? Or if many other of these turn out to be Pluto, bigger than Pluto even, do we want to start having 10, 12, 14, 18 planets by the time, you know, 2020 rolls around? Or should we actually make a more ordered system saying that all those things don't behave like any of the other planets in the first place. We shouldn't have 10 or 15 of those to begin with. Uh, should we reclassify? So uh, the, the astronomers held a meeting in 2006, a year after this discovery, to answer this exact question. What is a planet? Should we consider everything else we're finding out there planets, or should we actually make a new category for them? And there were definitely two big factions of astronomers at this meeting. So this was held in Prague in 2006 is the International Astronomical Union, which um, the, the joke amongst the, the astronomical community is the only thing these people really have um, the power to do is to name things. And that's just about it. They don't actually do research, they just name stuff. But uh, it is the body that names things and sets definitions. And so this is a perfect, um, a perfect opportunity for them. So at this meeting, they had the Plutophiles, which were uh, led by, by um, a, a faction of astronomers who were dead set on Pluto being a planet for, for legitimate reasons, but the Plutophiles versus the populists. And the, the lead, one of the lead people of the populists who uh, many of you guys may be familiar with is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, he's the, uh, the Hayden Planetarium director in New York City. And uh, the populists were arguing that Pluto does not fit with the planets, but it does fit with all those other objects out there in the Kuiper Belt. Compared with the Plutophiles, again, who wanted to include Pluto and many of the other objects in the definition of a planet. So that's exactly what the, the committee did. That's exactly what this meeting was devoted to, com uh, coming up with a definition of a planet. And there was a vote based on what the definition should be. And so we didn't name the, the it's kind of interesting. When we actually decided to figure out whether Pluto is a planet or not, or what we should call it, we did not pass a resolution saying, Pluto is a planet. We did not pass a resolution saying Pluto is not a planet. Instead, what we did was we set a, a list of criteria which an object must meet to be a planet. Um, it just so happened that, yes, um, the eight things, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, the eight normal planets exactly fit into that category, but Pluto did not fit into that category, and Eris did not fit in that category, and the other objects that aren't planet-like did not fit in those categories. So it it's by essence rule out Pluto, but it not it did not directly rule out Pluto. So here is what that definition said. Um, to be a planet, first of all, you must orbit the sun. And we mean specifically, you must be going around the sun and you cannot be going around another object that goes around the sun. So an example would be our moon goes around the earth. Our moon does not orbit the sun, even though the earth, which it does orbit, orbits the sun. So the importance of this is that this rules out all those large moons out there. So in, if you're a planet, you can't be a moon as well, which kind of makes sense. Second thing, now this, this is important for another reason. So as something gets larger and larger, as it's, 
you know, if you start with a small rock and you start collecting more and more rocks, more and more stuff starts attaching to you. Eventually, you're going to go from being roughly kind of, you know, oblong shaped potato, oblong shaped potato, potato shaped, um, football shaped. Uh, when a, enough of that stuff collects on you, now all of a sudden you have this big gravitational field. And that gravitational field pulls everything into a nice, perfect sphere. It's, it's kind of the same reason that if you look at um, on the space station when an astronaut pours out a carton of orange juice, that orange juice also forms a nice sphere. Uh, now, the reasons are slightly different, of course, but the basic idea is, though, that a sphere is symmetrical and that it's as closely packed as it can possibly be. And when you get a massive enough body, that's exactly what gravity pulls that into. So most pictures of asteroids you'll see or, or, or some comets, um, they, they tend to be much more oblong shaped or potato shaped or just irregular shaped in general. But every planet that we have, and actually Pluto included, is spherically shaped because its gravity forms it into a sphere. So the importance here though is that this is what rules out all those asteroids that orbit in the asteroid belt and many of the comets and these other smaller objects that they, they, they're simply, the, gra the gravitational pull is not strong enough to actually make them a nice sphere like all of our major planets are. But now the third key, or the, the third criteria, and this is what's key for the dwarf planets. In order to be a real planet, you can't be orbiting your, your neighborhood of the solar system with 18,000 other things. Jupiter is orbiting with itself. Earth is orbiting with itself. Now, if there was a large asteroid, for example, going around the asteroid belt, we don't really consider a planet because there are a huge number of other asteroids orbiting in that same region as it. Um, and in fact, we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, and this is exactly what Pluto falls under here. Pluto has a very large size uh, compared to many of these asteroids and comets around it, but it, does not, it has not cleared its orbit. It has not cleared the debris from its orbit uh, and made it its own. And um, so it, it's tough to say that there could be, you know, where Pluto orbits, it, it's tough to say that, oh yeah, we can have eight other planets all for, following that same orbit. It just doesn't really make sense. So we have, you know, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and 18 other things all going together. That doesn't work like that. So then what is a dwarf planet officially? A dwarf planet is any object which satisfies the first two criteria, but does not satisfy the third. In other words, a dwarf planet looks like a planet, it orbits the sun, but it, it doesn't have its own orbit. And as it turns out, almost all of these objects, uh, which classify as a dwarf planet, it, it, they, they differ from the rest of the planets in many other criteria as well, in many other properties, their mass, their size, their constitution, their orbit. But simply the, the, the one main, main difference between all of the dwarf planets and all of the major planets is that the dwarf planets do not have their own uh, well-defined orbit, whereas all of the major planets have their own orbit. So uh, there's actually kind of cool, you, you can look up on, um, uh, just Google it, IAU resolution for Pluto. And um, so I, I have here the actual text of the resolution which set these criteria themselves. So check this out here. So um, again, this is from the IAU website. And resolution B5, the definition of a planet in the solar system. And this goes through exactly what we just said. A planet is a celestial body that orbits the sun, has a su sufficient mass to make it circular or um, round, and has cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. And then it goes on to say a dwarf planet is a celestial body that orbits the sun, has su 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 mass, sufficient mass, is not a satellite, and has not cleared its neighborhood around its orbit. Uh, now, I like this though because first of all, there's a footnote. Um, in the footnote is where we actually declare what the planets are. So the footnote says the eight planets are Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. We don't, we don't see Pluto in that, but also this is not part of the official resolution. So, so I think it's kind of a, almost a tongue in cheek joke here. Uh, but the, the second thing I think is really cool about this, they, they, they passed resolution B5 and then the very next resolution B6. The IAU further resolves Pluto is a dwarf planet by the above definition, and is recognized as the prototype of a new category of trans-Neptunian objects, or we also call them Plutonian objects. So, or uh, Plutoids, I'm sorry. So Pluto is the, um, the prototype of a whole new class of objects. So it's, it's kind of cool because it's the prototype of that, even though it's not quite a real planet. So 
Anyway, um, this all kind of makes sense to me. And you could probably guess from the, the, the whole tone of this which class I fall into, a, plut uh, a plutophile or a populist. But still, I mean, the, the reasoning here does seem to make scientific logistical sense. And so the rest of the, uh, the, the dwarf planets, the confirmed dwarf planets we have today, there are five of them. Now, by the way, the, the moon is shown in the upper left here. Uh, our moon, or Luna, for, um, you know, whatever. Uh, for comparison, for size. These other five things, um, uh, Huamea, Make Make, Eris, Pluto, and Ceres, um, uh, these, these are the five officially recognized uh, dwarf planets, and we have a whole other list of a half dozen or a dozen or so candidates that are just waiting for more observational evidence to confirm that they are, in fact, dwarf planets. But you see here that the Eris is certainly larger than Pluto. And all of these are much smaller than the moon, much, much smaller than any of the other planets, including Mercury and Mars and, and the, the smallest ones we have out there. So it's kind of a cool story. And, you know, it's not just we didn't like Pluto or we didn't like the dog or whatever. It's, there, there are good, legitimate reasons, the, the most important of which being that Pluto is not alone. Pluto seems way more like these other stuff than the actual planets themselves. So, you know, I think it kind of makes sense. So anyway, if you want some more uh, info on this, uh, first of all, I'll read through the relevant section of the textbook assigned for this week. Uh, but also, there's a cool video of uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who was, um, again, he's a Hayden Planetarium director, uh, amazingly fascinating guy, um, hilarious to watch if you ever get to see him talk. Um, he also hosts a number of Nova specials on PBS. But so there's the short five-minute clip of him on John Daly's, or uh, John Stewart's Daily Show. Uh, but also, if you want some more info on it, he has a whole hour-long special on, um, it's a Nova special on PBS, uh, called The Pluto Files. And you can either obviously do a search for it or the link is here. So uh, it's cool stuff. And um, yeah, I hope you find it fascinating too.